Thank God for those that are here. We're going to continue in the message. Uh, I think there's a question about whether last week was number two or number three. Um, uh, I think it's, it's number three. You may not see number two out there online. We haven't loaded that one yet because I haven't picked it up. And I've got to see if it passes the litmus test. So you may not get a three, but I'll cover those things that I felt were important in three today because I sort of went off into certain other areas and it may not be perfect to it for putting on a line. So you may not see a number two, but you'll see a three for sure. So I, I want to name this one number three. But it may have power two. It doesn't matter. Power two is fine. That's probably better, especially if I leave the other one out from last week. We're going to go to uh, uh, Acts, the 19th chapter. We'll be starting there after an introduction. You all got your Bibles? Yes. Praise God. The Apostle Paul declared the Lord's expectation for all believers to receive the Holy Spirit anointing so they could operate with supernatural power. Did you know that? He wants all of us to operate with supernatural power. Because when he met the proselytes of John the Baptist, he asked this question in Acts 19, uh, chapter, verses 2 through 7. Says he said unto them, he's talking to the, the uh, uh, apostles. He went back to Jerusalem because they had heard they had go, he had gone into the house of a, a, a Gentile, and uh, they wanted to know why they see they had separation in those days, and uh, the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles. The Gentiles had nothing to do with the Jews. That was not God's will and purpose, because He was transitioning and changing things, opening the gospel up to whoever will, let so let him come, and partake of the waters of life freely. So Isaiah had already spoken about that a few thousand years before, but now it's being performed in Acts when we see that uh, they are entering into the house of those who were, were not uh, Jews but were Gentiles and declaring the word of God. And the, the one who started it all out was Peter, and uh, impetuous Peter is now explaining to them what took place. So, and then his apostle Paul taking it to the next level. This occurred probably uh, um, probably about 20 years after they had already introduced the Gentiles. And Paul was having another encounter with Gentile believers who had gotten baptized in the, by water by uh, John the Baptist. And some things that were shared by John the Baptist during his time, in his tenure in earth before they cut his head off. Uh, and uh, so these people here are some, some, had come into the kingdom of God through John the Baptist, he taught some things and laid out some things that were going to be performed when Jesus Christ came. So that's a little background. Acts the 19th chapter, verses 2 through 7. He said unto him, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? He said unto the proselytes and followers of John the Baptist. And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They might say Holy Spirit, depending on the version that you have of the Bible. Third verse, and he said unto them, and to what then were you baptized? And they said unto John the Baptist, by John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. Joe, if he were here, he's still, uh, he said, you got to correct that, Pastor. It's not John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. So I let him, I said, that's a good way to think about it. But most people know John the Baptist as John the Baptist, not John the Baptizer. <laughs> and that's it. But it's okay, you can be more accurate than what the pastor is. Fourth verse. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. Uh, this is in the word of God, and just people still, even today, don't understand there's a difference between being baptized in the Holy Spirit and baptized uh, in water. And so, so here's Paul reiterating what we should already know today. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptized, baptism of repentance, that's baptism in water, uh, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on the Lord Jesus. So John the Baptist stated the fact that Jesus was coming after him. And when he first introduced the Jesus Christ, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sins of the world. You find in First John, the first chapter, I think around the 29th verse, he introduces Jesus as he comes on the scene as he's baptizing people in the Jordan. And he mentioned that uh, there's a distinction between what he's doing and what Jesus is going to do. He says, I baptize you in water, but he shall baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
And that's what we're talking about here. He said that you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It's Holy Spirit and fire. Praise God. We need that fire element, which I preach about sometimes, to keep us uh, clean before the Lord, to burn off any impur impurities that's in our flesh, so that when we stand before the Lord, we'll stand clean and holy as an apt representative of the kingdom of God. Yesterday during the funeral, I'll just mention this, uh, the funeral of my uh, brother-in-law, Alan. Uh, at the end, I gave uh, a solicitation for those who want to receive Jesus as the Lord. And uh, his son came to me after it was all over. He said, I was so blessed by that. I was so glad you gave a solicitation. And quite a few people, the whole side over here, all the ones to be believers. They weren't believers, some of them. They'd been introduced years ago, some of them, but they hadn't received Jesus as Lord. And when I finished ministering, what their responsibility is to give diligence to make their calling and their election sure. I said, many are called, but few are chosen. I said, if you're going to be chosen by the Lord, he wants everybody to get saved, but you've got to act. You've got to respond. You have to give due diligence what he expects you to do and pay attention. And if uh, you haven't been going to church and you've been staying at home, and I went through a whole list of things that I go to with you all periodically. And uh, I said, if you fall in the category of any one of these four or five things where you just dropped out on the things of God and not paid attention to him, you can change all that in a moment. And when I give the solicitation for you to become a child of God, just follow my steps and you'll be in the kingdom of God. And I talked about writing your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. You can make sure your name's in the Lamb's Book of Life simply by saying you, you agree with me and you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life. And I said to him, it's really easy. You don't have to go through a whole bunch of things. I said, how many of you want Jesus to be the Lord? They said, yeah. And, uh, you've been trying it your way. It didn't work. Why don't you put somebody else on the, on the throne? I said, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let him control you in all the affairs of life, and you'll do well. And you don't have to worry about uh, what's going to happen when I die. Well, you're going to make it to heaven. I talked a little bit about the size of the north. There are two places. You don't want to go to the other place. I'm not going to talk about that today. I said, I'm going to talk about going to heaven. And you do that simply by making yourself a child of God. I said, in fact, when you leave here today, if you stumble on the curb and die, hit your head or whatever, you immediately go into the presence of the Lord. I think they like that. So you don't have to worry about death anymore and about your relationship with the Lord. It's covered. Rather than ignoring, and I said, this is happening when you ignore the things of God. But none of y'all are going to do that. Because we're telling you, we're giving you the opportunity to put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. And not, you don't have to be perfect when you first become a child of God. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to slip back where you're not supposed to be. And you don't know when you did it. Just say, Lord, forgive me. That's all I got to do. Say, Lord, forgive me. And don't practice it. Start practicing the things that he's telling you. But the way you have to find out what, not, what to practice is by studying the Bible. I said, so get you an amplified version, something you can read without any dials in it. They like that. From the King James Version, some of us don't understand what we're reading. Get a Bible you can understand. Study that. Do your best to read it, ingest it. Then you got to go to church. You have to go to church where other believers are there. And there was a Zoom and there was a regular church, and uh, they nodded that they understood. And uh, that's all you have to do with the child of God. See, I just led them to the kingdom of God. That was it. I don't have to do no hooping and hollering. Just real plain, direct, what the Bible says, and show them the scriptures. They, and Roger did a good job with the opening words, the Old Testament and the New Testament. He went into the New Testament and talked a little bit about seed falling on good ground and on bad ground. And uh, he explained that a little bit while he was talking about the verses. And so they knew what that meant, too. That what kind of heart do you have? He talked about what happens if you have the right kind of heart, what kind of production you're going to make you know, when, you, when you ultimately leave this world. And so they, all, they understood all of that. And so I think it was a good one. He said, I really, he said at the end of the service, uh, uh, I really enjoyed you going in that direction explaining about salvation. So many people here don't know. He said, even myself, I didn't fully understand. So he's going to be calling me uh, Kasten. That's with my nephew. He's going to be calling me. He said, he's got all the information so that he can be developing the things of God and he is going to start going to some church. He's going to go here initially. Probably through Zoom and then once we find a church for him. We'll direct them there. And my daughters are good at finding churches and things of that nature that will take, teach people the things of God. Let's go back to the verse here. We're in uh, Acts, the 19th chapter, and I'm going to go back to the uh, fourth verse. This said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, said unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Fifth verse. When they heard this, they were baptized 
uh, in the manner of the, the Lord Jesus, uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, notice this, then the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. It doesn't always come from a pastor laying his hands on a person, or a person who's a, the presenter, but ultimately, uh, one who's saved, one who's been listening to the Word of God, will ultimately have an opportunity. My dad, uh, uh, I watched him, my dad, when he first got saved, he was reared a Baptist, just a regular Baptist, but the Holy Spirit touched his heart, and uh, uh, came on him right before he even stopped smoking his cigarettes. The Lord filled him with the Holy Spirit. You know, it was just overwhelmed him when he heard the preaching, and he started speaking in other tongues. It didn't wait no, it didn't have to take him a long time or anything, just almost instantly. Just Some people just ready, day one. Once the eyes of their understanding is open. So it can comprehend with all the saints, the length, the depth, the breadth, the height. And to know, see, they don't know the love of God. They know the love of God that passes up all understanding. They think they have to give up something that's going to hurt them. You have to let them know that you're going to have a whole lot better things that you're going to have to enjoy once you make yourself a servant of the living God, a child of God. I said, the bounty that comes is not just going to heaven, but having heaven to go to heaven, living down here on earth. And so you need to go to a church where they, all those things are described. The whole counsel of the Lord Jesus Christ is declared so you know what the benefits are and the advantages and the fact that you don't have to be holier than thou, but you do need to grow in grace and in the knowledge, grow in unmerited favor. You don't deserve a thing. I said, none of us, I don't deserve nothing. And God has laid out that way, but I know what he wants me to do. And when he judges me, he's going to judge me based upon to whatever degree that I did those things that he made clear in the word of God. Amen. And I said, the mansion I have may be bigger than yours, maybe yours will be larger than mine. It may vary in size, but at least you have a mansion. But you did the things you're supposed to do. And people understand that in simple terms. Let's go to the uh, sixth verse. And when Paul laid his hands on them, notice this. The Holy Ghost came on those people that were listening, those apostolites, followers of uh, John the Baptist, who had heard the word, but it was not a complete word. And that complete word was made available to them through the preaching of the Apostle Paul. And they speak with tongues and prophecy. And there's two things they did as a result of hearing uh, the declaration of the word of God by the Apostle Paul. The word had to be declared, though. Uh, they not only spoke in tongues, they prophesied. So some of the other gifts of the Spirit may be manifested, too. But if you follow the word of God, some would say, well, all I got to do is prophesy. No, no. The, the prophetic gift operates as a result of one being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so tongues is a requirement that one has to speak in tongues to indicate that there really has been a baptism in the Holy Spirit. He says, all the men that were gathered there with him, the, the proselytes, the followers of John the Baptist, uh, there were 12 of them. That's pretty good, huh? The seventh verse. First step towards operating in the supernatural is receiving the Holy Ghost. Or in uh, modern vernacular, the Holy Spirit. And you got to receive him in power. I want you to notice that Paul implied that the followers of John the Baptist were already saved. You're already saved if you've been baptized in water confession of Jesus as the Lord of your life. You're saved. You can get saved before you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, some don't teach that, but the Word of God teaches that. All right? Yes. And you can go to heaven without ever speaking in tongues. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if you wait too long, you may not be able to go because you're being disobedient then. I don't need this. I don't want to. That, that's not of God, whatever, speaking against the Holy Spirit. Yeah, you get judged for that. And to what degree... Uh, it, I think it varies to what degree. You may or may not make it to heaven, depending on who you are. If you're a preacher preaching that kind of poison and didn't take the effort to find out that there's more and you should be sharing it to the people, I think the Lord would be a little more difficult. To, to, who much is given, much is required. He didn't know what to do and do it. If it's not, you'll be beaten with many stripes. Some of them are not telling you about the word, speaking in tongues in some of these denominational churches because they want to keep their stripes and keep their church. Because in a lot of the churches, you start talking about speaking in other tongues and hadn't been talking about it before, their denomination will throw you out. So your source of income goes, and a lot of people who are in that uh, arena that are preachers, that's the only source they have for money unless they're old enough to get a retirement. And the kids can't go to college, you can't get out, buy them a car, and you, know, you can't break your mortgage in it because all that came from the church because that's what you did for 15, 20, 30 years. And when they find out you're going to switch on them and start talking about the fullness of God, 
then they're ready to get rid of you. The deacons and the members of the church will throw you out in a number of these churches. Y'all understand that? So he's looking, I, I'm, I'm easy on preachers. Because some, they're smart enough to know that that's what they're supposed to be doing, but they're afraid. Because they're wondering, you know, what's going to happen to my income? Now when they get older, they may not be that afraid. Just think about it, if that was your position. And they pay you a good salary at your church, they take care of your health care and all that, and your kids have got enough money to go to school. And so and then you make a decision that we're going to start talking about speaking in tongues and being filled with the Holy Spirit. The deacons, you said, the deacons get wind of that, I'm gone. How many of y'all understand what I'm telling you? I know what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so that's what happens. It's not that they don't know, it's just they're afraid. And a lot of people are afraid of various things that stop them. So they need to come in contact with somebody who can show them that there's another way God will still take care of you. And they got to hear that kind of preaching over and over again so they don't take the chance, you know, to switch out and do all that they know to do. In their private devotion, they may be speaking in tongues. You never know. And uh, each time they, they do it, they feel guilty because they're not doing the full counsel of the Lord, and they know better. And so some of these guys know, a whole bunch of them know, they just won't do because they're afraid. Is that a good analysis of what's going on? So they prophesied, and they begin operating the gifts of the Spirit. So the first step is uh, to take, to receive the Holy Spirit is... Uh, uh, to receive an empower, receive him in power. Uh, or you want to operate in power, and when you have opportunity to, you can. I want you to notice that Paul implied that the followers of John the Baptist were already saved. The thief on the cross that hung next to Jesus, as soon as he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom, he was saved instantly. And although he didn't speak in tongues, the Bible says nothing about him speaking in tongues, he said, Jesus said to him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. But he made it to the size of the, well, the precursor to the size of the north. Size of the north. He said to him, this day shall you be with me in paradise. Paradise became the people that were there, the occupants. He gave, me, he gave captivity, made captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. So those who were held captive against their will, even though in a nice place, they were in a garden in the center of the earth. When Jesus rose from the dead, he emptied that place out. And all those people who, who had received him as Lord, looking forward to the Messiah that was going to come and trusted in him by faith, knowing that the Messiah one day will come and I'm going to go through all the abuse that I have to. Uh, and if I die before then, at least I made my confession that the Messiah is coming. I believe in him. So those people like that, just like the thief on the cross, uh, they went immediately with Jesus when he went back to heaven after he rose from the dead. Okay, and they went to the side, heaven and the sides of the north in New Jerusalem, which is in the process of being constructed right now. Y'all understand that? Yes. Okay. Okay, John made it clear. He said, you should trust in those, him who would come after me. And that's how those individuals ended up getting the fullness of God. However, Paul indicated that there was a subsequent endowment that, that they needed. So he's talking to the uh, 12 they were followers of John, and we already went through this. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and they, began to, they were dispatched to begin to do the things of God. I'm going to go to the 196 we talked about. They began to speak with tongues, and they prophesied. The Apostle Paul believed in the demonstration of power and of the Spirit. A lot of places they preach, they don't believe in the demonstration of power. As long as you stay away from the spiritual aspects and the power aspects, they're okay. And uh, they're conclusions about being baptized in the Holy Spirit in a lot of the denominational churches don't embrace it. There's a few that do, but most of them do not. And uh, it says that we don't need. What the world of need got to do with it? It said we don't need to have the gifts of the Spirit and uh, all those things that were mentioned there. And, and it said we're going to stay away from 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 13th chapter, the 14th chapter. And we're going to leave the 15th chapter alone. We, there's plenty enough, ample supply that's in the Word of God we don't need to know what that is talking about. That's how they preach it. So you need to know about that. You get into error when you start. That people start doing things they're not supposed to. And so it just stays, settle, level. You've been baptized in the water. You're going to church. You're living the life to the best of your ability. God accepts that. You don't want you doing nothing else. And so that, that they talk speaking in tongues, laying hands on the sick. And, that God will do miracles today in his day. But uh, all that went out with the apostles. The apostles left way back in what year this is. 
2034. 24. You get what kind of saying. So they've been going for 1,000, 2,000 years. You know, and uh, so that was enough. We, we just talk about who Jesus is, and we're going to look back, just like those people in the past, those that know a little bit more, they're trying to trick you. They look forward, and uh, they were counted as Christians. We're looking back, and we're counted as Christians. None of them spoke in tongues back in those days. But uh, and then all these newcomer things, they, you get off in the air, so just leave it alone. You say that's all you need to do, you'll make it to heaven. And uh, you may or you may not, it depends on what you in, are introduced to as you live your life out. And so that's the condition that we're in today. Um, I want to transition here to another part that, that Paul wants us to understand also. 1 Corinthians 2 and 5. It says, uh, let, uh, this, he's the demonstration of the spirit and the power is what Paul believed in. I mentioned it earlier. And then he said the following, 1 Corinthians uh, the second chapter, verse 5, it says, that your faith should be, not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, a lot of smart people who are teaching the word of God that don't believe in the perpetuity of spiritual gifts. Any mainstream denomination, most of them, they, they don't say anything about the Holy Spirit. They're like, it's mute. You, you can say, well, we're reading the scripture, and they'll jump while they're reading this. They get to a passage that has to do with the Holy Spirit. They have a nice, unique way to jump somewhere else way away from that so you don't start asking questions. And uh, I, um, I was in a Baptist church for a while, and I asked my, my pastor, I said, you know what's in the Word of God, why don't you teach it? He said, you just don't understand. I said, well, uh, aren't you the one supposed to help me get understanding about why you don't teach it? And uh, he never could answer it. And at that time, I, my wife was, uh, uh, had cancer or something like that. And uh, we were at church, and uh, we were faithful to that church. I said, I just want you to get some oil. I heard you're supposed to have oil. You're supposed to lay hands on him, pray for her. I said, will you at least do that? And I said, I noticed there's no oil in the church, and nobody ever lays hands on anybody or pray any kind of prayer of faith. I said, we're supposed to do that, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, explain to me why we're not doing it. And so two weeks went by. He got a bottle of oil, and there was a Sunday night service. And uh, they pray for people Sunday night, but they never pray for God to do anything. Just give them grace, give them mercy, take away the pain and all of that, but nothing to heal, nothing about being healed. They didn't preach, they didn't, they didn't pray that way. You find that most of the mainstream, they stop just short of saying, asking God to do something supernatural. And so um, they had oil that day. He says, I come to do what you said. It's not me saying, it's the Bible saying that's what you're supposed to do. And so, and so uh, he brought all the elders and ministers together and anointed my wife with oil. Except they didn't anoint her. They took the, the bottle of oil, the bottle, and they just poured it on her head. They just went all down her clothes and everything. And, uh, uh, but the Holy Spirit worked that night. The healing took place that night. And it touched them all. And so we don't even believe, but because we did what we were supposed to do, that's what, that was the message. The number of them noticed that. Some of the other ministers, I was a young minister then. And that's what the, the comment was that we didn't even believe in that. And when he poured that oil on her, the power of God began to operate. And then they heard her testimonies after that. And so uh, they were paying attention. A number of those guys uh, was able to embrace the fullness of God. And so they still are embracing the fullness of God because they, got so, they saw it demonstrated. And even in the church that didn't subscribe to that um, way of teaching or preaching. Praise the Lord. Y'all with me? Yes. The Lord has a way in which he can get things through to people when there are all kinds of roadblocks everywhere to stop. You don't need, you don't need, you don't need. And then they're thinking, but I had the same problem that she went through. I need, to need it myself right now. And I see that I can go to the Lord and uh, do the steps that are necessary and just trust like she did. And receive a healing. That's all. Just, you just have to see it one time. Then you, you'll be uh, one who's a believer in all the things of God. Acts 11 and 15. And I began to speak here again. I started off with this, but Peter's trying to explain why he went into the house of a person who was uh, a Gentile and not a Jew. And they weren't supposed to do that. And he had done that. And his explanation there is, is given in uh, Acts 11 and 15 through 18. 
And uh, he said, the reason I went into the house is because the Lord directed me there. He went all the way back. Acts the 10th chapter, if you want to write, read the whole story about him going to the house of Cornelius, the centurion. So they're rebuking him because he went into his house and he preached to them in the house of people who are not clean. They're unclean people because they hadn't confessed Jesus as the Messiah. And so how would they confess him? Because they, they never opened up the door and opportunity for them to make themselves a child of God. Okay, so Acts 11 and 15, here is uh, Peter explaining. And it got, the Lord got the right one to do the explanation because boasters Peter. He didn't care about, you know, if, it's, if the Bible says to do it, I'm going to do it. I don't care who, who are you. So impetuous Peter, you know, always the first one to take a step when he thinks something was right. And uh, he demand. To, to try it, at least to try it, even if he made a mistake. So here in Acts 11 and 15, and as I began, this is Peter talking here, recounting what had happened to him in the house of Cornelius. The Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us in the beginning. He said, I was there with you guys too on the day of Pentecost, for, you know, Acts, the second chapter, the fourth verse, and all of the things surrounding him that took place on that day. And I began to speak with tongues and do all and prophesy and do all those things too. And so this is what, and notice it. He said, and when I was speaking, I'm just talking about the road. I was the word of God. I wasn't speaking in tongues or anything, just declaring the word a normal way. The Holy Ghost fell on them. And as uh, and on us as it began. So the same way we didn't just fall on, they started speaking in tongues and prophesying just like we did on the on the day of Pentecost. And notice this. 16 verse. You remember I had a word of the Lord, how that John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost. So he's explaining to people who should know better, but because they broke some of their, their rules that they had as uh, Jews, they wanted to rebuke him and sit him down for a while. And so he said, wait a minute, the Lord did this, I didn't do this, but the Bible said he was going to do that, and we saw it firsthand in the uh, the proselytes of uh, John, and also we see it again uh, in the house of Cornelius. Those people who were Romans primarily, but they certainly weren't Jews. I went and preached because the Lord gave me a vision that I need to go to his house. And when I got to the house, the Lord met me there, and he's the one that caused the Holy Spirit to fall on them. And he caused them to speak with tongues. And because I saw them speak with tongues, I said, who am I to hold with whole water? So they hadn't baptized them yet. So after they spoke in tongues, we got to be obedient to what the Bible says, the whole canon of Christ. So I took them out at nighttime and baptized them in the, in the water, river or wherever they would baptize them. Yeah, so there was, that's, I'm glad he put that in there about baptizing them in water. Notice that's after they received the Holy Spirit in measure and in power. He then took them out. So you got to be obedient to the totality of God's word. But well, then Baptists going and all that water. We don't need water no more. I got baptized in the Holy Ghost. No, you need to do exactly all the things the Lord sent you to do. And you need to put yourself in water because it indicates that there's something that's taking place on the inside that other folks need to see. Especially if the other people don't believe in speaking in tongues. At least they believe in a relationship with the Lord that you outwardly showed when you were immersed in water. So even if it's backwards, you need to do it. Amen. And you don't sprinkle. You immerse. The word there is complete immersion, submersion. You can't, I, I wouldn't look at the, the, the words that are used there. You can't twist it to make it mean something else. No, it's not sprinkling. When you take a baby, you sprinkle him to dedicate them to the Lord. You didn't baptize him. You can't baptize babies because when you go to a water baptism, it's a knowing that I've made a relationship with the Lord. And what you're showing visibly is that I've changed on the inside and I'm washing away the old Adamic nature from me and I'm going to change and begin to live right. If I cuss before, I'm going to do my best not to cuss anymore. If I fought before, I'm not going to jump on you once I, you see. So you're demonstrating that uh, there's a change that has come on you. Your attitude has changed. And your way you walk and carry yourself has changed. And you're not going to see me drunk anymore. I used to be drunk all the time at parties and people would say, say now so much for that. I don't, I'm not living that kind of lifestyle. That has been a wonderful change that has come over me. So that's what that, that's why you get immersed in water. So that, you, so that the old nature will be washed away. And there's a new birth that's taken place in my life. An identification with Jesus as Lord. And you can use the scriptures to explain it. 
Paul talks about it in great depth, so you can't, the, it's, it's full, the scripture is full with what you need to say to people who don't, have not been introduced to the, the concept of water baptism as opposed to uh, spirit baptism. Now in 16, 17 verses, as Peter continues, for as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did to us, you see that? The like gift. That means we're supposed to have the same kind of gift that they had on the day of Pentecost. And what did they do on the day of Pentecost? Well, I should be doing the same thing today. I should emulate what they did on the day of Pentecost. But some churches are acting like, just because you had a fit and danced all night for hours, whatever, on the floor, never said, a, never had tongues come out your mouth, because you were jerking and jerking like they do in some churches, they thought that, well, it could be the Holy Spirit trying to influence you and get you into it, but it's not baptism. It's not baptism in the Holy Spirit. Fear of God may overwhelm you, but you still have to go through the steps. That, and notice this, 17 verse. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I should withstand God? This more is stated in uh, the book of Acts because he had taken with him uh, some Jewish people who were already uh, had already been baptized in the Holy Spirit and all of that. And uh, he, he, they saw them speaking with tongues, and he saw them, I think they prophesied also, and they saw that. And they knew that it's the same gift, the same Holy Spirit that came on us when we began to speak with other tongues. On the day of Pentecost, we were there and we did it. So those, we, sent, we came with Peter, we saw the same thing Peter did, and they demonstrated the same works of power uh, that, they, that the Lord demonstrated in our lives. So they got the same thing, there's nothing different. You know, and they, they may have had a, a, a spit, a fit, and fell on the floor and kicked and all of that. You know, maybe so. Maybe the Holy Spirit may have overwhelmed them to that point. But if they didn't speak with other tongues or the speak of utterance, they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's what happens today. You have good service and uh, kids, uh, emotional kids and older folks, whatever, uh, get emotional, clap their hands and start hollering and screaming and they fall out. They got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, did they speak with any tongues? No. They got whelmed by the Spirit of God, but they didn't get baptized. Am I helping you all? Because his teaching is going out there. Today. If you had an emotional outburst or whatever, you got baptized in the Holy Ghost. Did you speak with tongues? No, you didn't. You just had an experience and a feeling from the Holy Spirit. You probably felt the Holy Spirit, but the Lord not done with you yet. There's some more needed in order for you to have the fullness, the fullness of God. Am I helping y'all some? So I hear people saying that to me. Oh, have you ever been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I did. They said, we hollered and cried all for hours, and I felt so emotional and good, and I ran around the whole church ten times. <laughs> By myself, I felt the Spirit making me run. It probably was the Spirit making you run. But you didn't take all the steps necessary to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I know this lady that's in our church every time that the music gets up. She gets up and starts hollering and screaming. And, yeah, and running and dancing. That's good. But did she ever speak with other tongues? As the Spirit gives her utterance. If not, then she hasn't got the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't mean she's not saved. It means she's not full of the power of God. That the gifts of the Spirit won't operate in her yet because she hasn't grown to the point where they can operate, operate through, speak, and when you speak in tongues, it opens the door for the supernatural manifestation of the other power gifts that they never talk about in churches that are not full gospel. So they bypass. Notice this. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 13th chapter, 14th chapter, they bypass that. They don't talk about that. So they do, they hit it and run. And if they hit it, they go to the 13th chapter, they talk about love is greater than all, and they jump real quick. Because somebody like me would say, wait a minute, brother, wait, you didn't read that right. You didn't read all of it. You got to read the verses before and after and to see if you still have that same conclusion. <laughs> Love is the greatest gift. Yeah, but you need to get this. You got to read all this in context. Love, I agree with you too, but I don't agree with the way you presented it. You took the piece you wanted and jumped. And when you're preaching, you always jump. Never want to talk about the details so people know how it really works. I, I teach the whole council of everything. That's why people get mad at me. Why do you spend all that time? Because the problem with the world is we can't see no manifestation of power because they never, they never developed to the full statue of Christ Jesus. 
They're not equipped to demonstrate anything. And uh, I'll just say it this way. With the kind of things that come against you in this world, you're going to show enough have to have the Holy Ghost to overcome coming. Yeah. I fell down the step. I said, Lord, why don't you let me run and fall in because you're still human? I understand that. But he's so full of the Holy Ghost, why don't he get, it? watch this. I'm going to make sure you get it all. He fell down the step, he's full of the Holy Ghost. Yeah, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah, I'm an apostle. Why didn't the Lord just come in and just, instead of five days later, why did he make you wait five days? Why didn't you get instantly healed? Because the same thing happened during the time of Christ. The only time you saw anybody getting instantly healed usually was when Christ was involved. But he's full of power. There's no limit on the amount of supernatural power he has. There's a limit on mind. Mind grows to grow in grace, which means I never get there. And in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, so I try to grow. Some say you, you can make the full statue. I don't think we live long enough to make the full statue of Christ Jesus. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. You don't. So there's certain things that, because uh, I, I looked even at uh, uh, last night. I wasn't trying to go. I just stumbled across it again. The scripture in Elisha, uh, he died. Said so he died from his malady. He's about ninety some years of age when he died. And the Bible makes it clear, so nobody can mess up. He did all these supernatural feats. Elisha feats in, during his lifetime, bringing people from the dead. I think he also did one with breathing in the mouth of the kids. and this just, just extraordinary miracles. But he said he died from the melody that he had. But you know, you have to remember there's other laws that govern how long we live and everything. And it's once appointed to man to die, and after it's a judgment. That's, that's reiterated in the New Testament. So then at some point you're going to die. I don't care how much Holy Ghost power you have. But watch this. His bones later on, the Moabites were there fighting against the Israelis. And uh, if you read the scriptures carefully, and it really fell in the hole, the, the tomb of Elijah, and it was broken up. And he contacted the bones of Elisha and jumped up healed, completely healed. From I don't know what kind of, they probably put an arrow through him or something, but he was dead when he fell and hit the blood. But the point is, why is it that the bones, y'all go check me out. Why is it that a dead body can fall on the bones of a dead man, Elisha, who had been dead for a while, and his bones had so much virility and power, Zoe, the life of God in it, that when they touched him, the man touched his body, the dead body touched his body, he jumped up alive again. Now, I explain why would God do that. I don't know. The secret thing belongs, but I know it's in there, and he put it in there for, in, the, in the Bible for a reason, so my faith can grow. Now, when I fell on the steps, I don't know why God didn't do this. I told y'all about the Lord floating me in the air. It's been about six months ago. I fell in the, yard, in the rocks that we had. I slipped off of one and I, I rolled forward and couldn't stop myself. And the Lord put me to sleep. Right when I said, please, Lord, let me hit my head, I fell asleep. And then when I woke up, I was on the other side of the uh, enclosure. Here's a barrier. Scrawl, sprawl out my whole six foot three frame, straight. I bumped my head on a, I think we had, we were getting ready to plant some plants in the, the container. So I bumped my head, I woke up. It was nothing, it was just a bush, you know, you have bushes, uh, plants inside of the little plastic container. It was in a, a basin there that we were getting ready to use. And then I woke up. It must have been the amount of time that they laughed for me saying, God, please don't let me hurt my head. Because I, that, if I hit that with full force, I'd have been in a bad way. So, and then I woke up, and uh, I'd say in terms of the amount of time it was before me saying, Lord, please. Yeah. And uh, when I woke up, it probably was uh, 30 seconds, 20 seconds, something like that. It just happened. I got up, and I, said, I was surprised, shocked. Y'all need to hear supernatural from today. I mean, you always reading, but won't nobody. Well, there's some people here today who get sad. So I got up. 
I was startled. I said, no knot on my head, no broken bones, no nothing. Everything works fine. And I tell somebody they're not going to believe it. They may not believe it. There are probably just a few people that I could tell that would even believe it. You know. But that's the first time it's ever happened to me. Now, let's go back. i just tell you that. The Lord, uh, that was a miracle. For those who didn't, didn't understand that. That was a miracle. I belong to him. He's no respect to person. We live for him. We ain't in the miracle. It'll come. So, so why do you do that? Because it says the spirit wills. First Corinthians 12th chapter. Okay, how much Holy Spirit you have, how much praying you've been doing. No miracles unless it's the will of the Holy Spirit. He's the controller of when the miracles just get dispensed. I don't know what all the criteria is. I don't know. Some people try to act like they know. I don't know. But one thing I do know, most of the time, you've got to live for God the right way. And then he may let a person who's not even saved have a miracle. For his own purposes. So I don't know. That's a secret thing I don't understand. Or a devil can get, seem like they, let, they live 20 years more than they're supposed to. And you never see them get saved. But somebody pray for them and they live another 20 years. I think that's so that, so that God, the people, other people watching, even the angels of God can see the grace of God. That we know that we can't earn nothing. But that person can tell you, they'll tell you that the, the Lord did do it. He kept me alive. I don't know why he's still leaving, keeping me alive. They probably know. They're probably lying. They just don't want to do right. And God let them live. He let a lot of things happen that he, from our vantage point, he said, why don't you just take them out? Because he has some other purposes he wants to fulfill in the earth realm other than those things that relate directly to you. And even with our president, the guy who Attempted to take his life. Well, God don't need nobody to take anybody's life. <laughs> well, well, what do you do is uh, you just stop your heart from beating. Give you a stroke while you stand there talking. So he don't, he don't need no help from man unless he wants to. So he was, well, why didn't? Well, because in any way, it wouldn't have been supernatural. It wouldn't have been of God. So you don't have to do that that way. Now, if everybody there was in a, a, a bomb that took off, then that would be t- different, perceived differently probably. But the man's too wicked. And God be trying to save us so that we can live our lives out without people assuming they know why certain things took place. But if it, he just dropped down dead from a heart attack and they check him out and said, no, there was no foul play or whatever, he just died because he old. Then can't nobody come out with guns shooting your boy and shooting your girl and hanging them and doing all kinds of wicked things that's in their heart anyway because they think you're the one who's the perpetrator. Y'all with me here? So a lot of things because God is just, I thank God that he's in charge. I'm glad that the man not in charge of nothing. He can't be trusted. He's proven he can't be trusted. Hatred and meanness, nastiness, just in them. Especially if they're not saved. And then you listen to their mouth. When they talk, you can tell that person there is of the devil. You know, I want that kind of person in charge. I want them doing nothing. I I want God to (coughs) to protect whatever needs to be protected until it's his time for things to happen. (coughs) And in the meantime, excuse me, I'm going to continue praying, trusting him that he's going to take care of me because I, I belong to him. And that's what you should do. Things that belong to man, you take care of man's stuff. Things that belong to God, none of your business. He ain't going to tell you why he does that. He does it because he's God, he's Lord. Why did, I, why did Elisha fall down? I, can I just teach so that be, you not, none of y'all will ever be barking on the floor because, you know, it's not scriptural. You're not going to do this weird, weird stuff that folks do. You're not going to expect God to do those kind of things. 
But if you get a, a balanced presentation of God's word, can't nobody mislead you Amen. in nothing. Hallelujah. Is that clear? Yeah. Come on, what's done? Praise the Lord. So let me finish up, uh, and I fell out on the steps, because people ask the question, he, he, you know, they're floating, and I don't believe he floated. Uh, you know, I, I, God didn't do it all the time, but well, why didn't he do it that time? Because then, y'all, every time I jump, fall off a step, then am I going to be expecting me to float in the air? <laughs> or then, the, uh, the other question is, he floated in the air that time, uh, why can't I float in the air? I don't know. Maybe you can. Now, I'll tell you about the first introduction to all of this here. I uh, was in a wreck, car wreck, you know, back uh, when I was in high school, college, last year of college, uh, just before I got married. I was in an automobile accident coming down Pachico Pass. And uh, car was completely demolished and all of that. The only place I had to live was inside of this needs to you see you supposed to declare the word of God period. I am I'm gonna stop after this. It's a good place to stop, but I'm gonna tell a full toast testimony. And so I I felt sleepy coming down Pachico Pass. It's back in the late sixties. And uh, I was a Christian then, young young still living for the Lord to the best of my ability. And uh, so I fell asleep. I put my jacket on, a letterman's jacket on, fell asleep. And uh, then I heard this bump, booming sound. I had fallen asleep when we were uh, on the side street. The side street uh, uh, had hit the back of the car and turned the car upside down. And uh, I forgot how many feet it was, about 50 feet or so. I, they, they believed that I was airborne. So I came from a side street, from Pachico Pass, to the side street that was jutting out towards Pachico Pass, and my wheel on my my car was knocked up in the air. So I landed upside down on my car. After the 50 feet, it crashed on top. And so all the wheels, the force of it was so great that all the wheels were bent out on the car. On the car. All four wheels were bent, but it, it wouldn't roll. Top was smashed in. Every window just about it was broke except the one that I was next to, upside down, the driver's compartment. And there's only a little enough space for me to squeeze out to get out the car. Everything has been crushed. And I ran to the street. I ran to the street. And uh, as I ran to the street, these old folks were coming out the mountain. You know, I, you always hear me talking about a Magoo car. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like I'm a good car. God has a sense of humor. I didn't tell you that you didn't even have an idea, no construction in your mind, because I was watching the good cartoons then. Yeah. As a as a as a dumb as an adult. And so they stopped. I was trying to wave somebody to, to pick me up when the car was way out in the middle of the field after fifty feet. And uh, this people stopped and one of them looked like an angel of God or something. He, he's a white man. But his hair was all down the side of his face. And all I know is his face was like, almost like a glow, a white. He wouldn't say nothing. He was looking straight ahead, this little Magoo car. And the lady started talking. She was white also. She was real old, though. And she said, I said, yo, give me a ride. I got to go call the police. I felt my, my, my car is damaged and all that. She said, you to talk about your car. You should thank God he let you live. I said, we see that car over there. And then she said, this was an act of God. See, he let you have the wreck, but he protect you and let you live. He said, but you're not doing what you're supposed to do fully. He has to get your attention. And then, now listen, this is where I get this from. People are wondering in other scriptures, spirits of just men made perfect. Okay. Saints go to the sides of the north. I believe that periodically, I, sometimes I don't tell people this, there's all the things that God wants to be done and he'll dispatch a resurrected saint. Because the woman said to me, I was like you a few years ago, running from God, not doing what he told me to do, and he put me in an awful accident. And he, an awful accident. And that's when I said, who y'all is frightened me then? Because I knew the word pretty well. I said, where y'all folks from? <laughs> and he said, watch this. We're from uh, 
uh, the mountains in, in the hills there. We just left a service to come, come and get you. And I just said, come, I think, I don't know if she said come get you. The Lord had us be here. But we just left from a church service in the, mount, in the hill. The mountains in the hills behind, the, over the side of Pachico Pass. And I started thinking, I said, I wonder if they came from the sides of the north, in Mount Zion, the sides of the north. But I was preaching one day, that's what came to me and said, those people that said that, uh, and she had, she lived here, she died, she, uh, saint, got resurrected, but she'd be out from the body to be present with the Lord. So they were in, in Mount Zion, on the sides of the north. The Bible talks about the people that are there and said that the Lord dispatched her. And then you think, Grandma going to come back to me. I hope she's saving all that, but I don't think that she may come back. But she could. And we, we want to throw things away, just like Samuel came back. Didn't Samuel come back? Prophet Samuel came back. And I said, that was a spirit beam. That was the devil. That was in all the Bible makes it clear. It was the very Samuel that had gone to heaven before. And he came back to give some direction to uh, the king who had was disobedient at that time. Who was the king? Saul. Saul. See, there's a Bible scholar. So see, that's why you have to read your Bible so you know things that, that is a, it's in sync with the things of God. He came back, gave instructions to the king, and he left again, went back to the sides of the north. Went back to, at that time, Jesus had not resurrection from the dead, so where did he go? Where did he go? Was a man Abraham. See it? Because it hadn't been emptied out yet, because Christ hadn't died on Calvary's cross yet. You see that? So he went back to, she was in, come from there to the earth and went back. Uh, and she came from there to the earth. Well, who, she, who's I talking about? <laughs> oh, Samuel. For Samuel. Yeah, Samuel comes from the. But, you know, I, I, I'm probing. <laughs> So, and uh, I have Bible scriptures on those things, but the, the lady made it clear that uh, they were not just regular people, that they had come for an audience for me. And so, and as soon as she, they had given me, driven me to the place where I was supposed to make the telephone call, they disappeared, thin air. Wow. And so that lets you know they were not of this world, they were other worldly people. Uh, I would say from the sides of the north. Anyway, that's enough on that. And I don't, the, it's a long testimony, but that's long enough. That's enough to let you know that the Lord will have, let you experience certain things without you dying. That was the key because the, the high patrol came and picked me up. That's why we had the old fashioned telephones, you know. They had one out there at the end of this long run of, of freeway. That was the only one I knew of that could see. And I called him. He came out to get me. He said, I don't know how you live. Said anybody in that kind of accident should be dead. Said we're going to throw a chain on this car and drag it out. It a long, long chain. They drug it out. The tow truck drug it out, and uh, then they put it on the truck. But they waited. He said because it's still sizzling, it can explode. So I don't know how long we sat out there. We waited quite a while to make sure it didn't blow up. And then, then uh, he took me to where I needed to go. And he said this to me. He said that. Uh, you fortunate to be alive," said another black youth from college. So he's from San Jose State. He has had information that us know. He's from San Jose State. He went up a tree. Said he wasn't like you because his car got all crushed and he got crushed too and he died in the tree. He said we had to go get a tow truck to pull him out the tree. But 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 you, I don't know why you live, but you should be dead. And I've always thought about that. He let you live, but you should. Purpose. Got a purpose. So if you don't do the words, things of God, are not, and you're resistant to the directive the Lord give you, then you won't be able to live out your, your fullness, your age, your full life. So I just say to you, if God's got a call on you, He's going to get you. And uh, I thank God for the experiences I've had. Some have been good, some have been bad, some have been frightening, but I got to live through them. Yeah. And uh, my foot, it feels good right now. Thank God I can walk. Thank God I could have had a crack 
I could have uh, lived the rest of my life. And I've seen some believers who are just like me who are living a good life. They got a terrible limp because I don't know why. It's in the mind of God. Why didn't he heal every, why doesn't he heal every single thing? I don't know. But this morning, make sure I'm going to say this and I'll let you go. Uh, make sure y'all watching the, the, this teaching that I do in the morning, on Sunday morning. It's another whole level of teaching. I didn't know I was going to do that when I taught it. You really need to watch it. There's about eight or nine episodes. They're broken up. But like the ones that uh, I taught this morning, seeing behind the challenges and things of that nature, you need to look at every single one of them. It will bless you. You probably, I guarantee you that if you watch those, an uh, incident or problem you're going through right now will come up. And you get the answer to it just watching me teach that. I got the answer to mine this morning. So get up at 9 o'clock and watch it. Usually it's two of them. And then uh, time sign in to Zoom at 10 o'clock. But uh, you'll be blessed immensely. And some things I can't get into anymore. We, it's not a setting like we had then. But you interact with me and ask questions and all that. I guarantee if you watch that, the answer to a lot of your questions will be answered. It's, it's the same Dr. Nutt, probably a little younger. But uh, I you tell say? you. Huh? What you say? Yeah, it's a younger version of me, but uh, I tell you what, it is really sharp and pressured in, and uh, it looks like I do now to some degree. But uh, you will, I guarantee you will be blessed, and a lot of the questions that you want to ask, answer, will be answered in detail. Uh, I had a question that was lingering in my mind. I should have known the answer to it, but I didn't until I watched it this morning. Now I know the answer. Listening to myself preach the word. Oh, I heard the answer. That's right. Real clear. Okay. I had to repent. I said, I'm sorry that I didn't remember what the word said. Now I remember. Thank you, Lord. God bless you. So uh, up in the booth, I'm going to need you to focus on my beautiful mother, the camera, if you can get it on her for what we're getting ready to do. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So this part of the service is called In Other Words, where we do a brief recap of pastor's word. And so the in other words for this week is it's a God thing. You can say thing or thing in terms of what he, he talked about. Hold it this way. Don't touch anything. Okay. All right. No, it's not going to play anything. So I have a couple of notes. So Pastor talked about, um, you know, the different miracles that we've experienced, even in this church. I mean, I can look around and see miracle, 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 and another miracle on the way. Miracle, 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 miracle. I, I just, miracle, miracle, miracle. It's amazing. This, this church is full of supernatural miracles. So usually we would say it's a God thing you wouldn't understand, but y'all do understand because we've been a part of this ministry. So my, I was listening to someone, um, a preacher, and I saw this and it reminded me of what pastor was talking about in terms of um, not being limited to the way that we see the world because God operates in the supernatural, right? Very powerful. So turn that around, Mom. Can you all see this? Roman numerals, right? I equals 1. For, I'm going to do a quick, my, you know, my dad's a math guy. I equals 1, the V equals 5, the X equals 10, right? So this Roman numeral is what? Do you know? So it's 9, because the way that it works is that you subtract, if it's a smaller number, you subtract it from the number that's in front of it. So the X is a 10, the I is a 1. So when you subtract, that becomes what? Nine. Nine. So what the minister was showing was, with one stroke, how would you make this six? Because if you put the I in front of it, that would be what? Eight, right? If we put another I down, it would be eight. If we put a five in front of it, what would that become? 
Remember, 9 minus 5 would be what? 4. four. So, th so that, like, in our natural mind, we're like, there's no way that we could make this 6 with just one stroke of the pen. There's no way with the Roman numerals. There's no way. And he said, well, there is a way. That makes it 6. And I love that demonstration because it shows that we think one way and we're limited, but the Lord is supernatural and he thinks above our ways. His ways are above our ways. We cannot limit him. We're limited sometimes by the, super, by the natural. It's a Red Sea. How do we get across? That's nothing for God. You fall down the stairs, don't break a hip, nothing for God. Cancer healed multiple times, nothing for God. Sometimes all it takes for us to go from the natural to the supernatural is God just doing one little stroke. Have a good week. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612 8 San Jose, California 95161-2822 or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.